In order to graph for the 60 jump test, once more, the way that the table is set up has a huge impact on the ease of the ability to create the graph. So here we have jump height and ground contact time on the left of the table. And at the top of the table, we have first 15 jumps and last 15 jumps. As with all of the data provided in these tutorials, these are fake values. Additionally, the units on the side are not going to be graphed. Specifically, those are just there as a key or a reminder for us for what the units of that variable are. So thanks to the way this graph is set up, we can highlight all nine cells here, come up to insert graph. We're gonna go with a line graph. And once more, we are going to use a secondary vertical axis. As you can see here, the first 15 jumps are on the left, the last 15 jumps are on the right. And we are going to select the ground contact time. We are going to format the data series or use the change series chart type. For ease, we're just going to go format data series. On the right over here, select a secondary axis so that ground contact time is now listed and once more, we need to add our axis titles. We have the titles on the horizontal axis, so we are going to go primary vertical and secondary vertical. And we're going to apply those units. This is ground contact time in seconds. And here we have jump height in inches. And here we have the 60 jump test graph in its entirety. We have discussed fatigue index for both the RAST and the Wingate test, and we need to create one for the 60 jump test as well. So, fatigue index. There is a simple formula that we can apply here. It will be equals two open parentheses, select the information or the data of the last 15 jumps, subtracting the first 15 jumps, close one parenthesis divided by the first 15 jumps again, close your second parenthesis times 100. So this tells us that there was a percent change or a negative percent change of 55.56%. How that is reflected we see that half of 18 would be nine, and this is just greater than a 50% loss of performance or jump height. Now we can do the fun little click and drag feature, make sure you see that little plus sign, click and drag. This is a positive value, and we see that is a 25% increase from 1.2. If you think about it as 1.2 divided by four, that'll be three tenths of a second. So 1.2 plus 3 tenths of a second is 1.5 seconds. And though the value is positive, that's a 25% negative change in performance because a faster ground contact time is going to be more advantageous than a long ground contact time. In this first box here, we are going to see a pretty impressive initial jump height. We are going to use our orange for this with a pretty steady decline on the way down. Similarly, the first 15 jumps may have a pretty impressive jump height with a slightly less degree of decline. Now, don't pay attention to the degrees identified on the ruler. That's just so I can draw a straighter edge than I'm generally capable of. And here for the final or the far right graph, we're going to see a minimal decline compared to the other two profiles in the jump height. So coming back to the first graph here, we're going to begin graphing the ground contact time. We will see that there is a pretty impressive amount of time spent on the ground in the first 15 jumps. This should be very this is a profile where the person is going to be quite springy. They're able to quickly achieve that 90 degrees of knee flexion and then bounce back off of the mat. So we'll see that the line intersects over here, more so on the left of the table or of the graph. For the second profile here, 
we will see that the lines intersect more so in the middle of the, of the uh, graph there. And here for the third profile, we see that the lines intersect more so over to the right. So if we imagine that these graphs are each divided into thirds, I'll mark that with a different color here. And we're just going to estimate visually where each of these thirds of the graph are. The lines intersect to the left, so there is a greater emphasis on great jump height, brief ground contact time, lines intersect in the first 15 section or that far left third. This would represent an athlete that is more of the anaerobic profile. Now if we look at the middle graph where the lines intersect, if we estimate our lines of thirds, very good estimation here, uh, we see that the lines intersect between the thirds. So if we're being more realistic, that other line is about there. They intersect in the middle. So that tells us that that athlete is able to maintain pretty good performance values while being able to resist fatigue a fair amount. So this person would be more combined. Now over here on the far right, we see that the lines, once we draw our thirds, intersect in the far right third. This tells us that although the initial values, the initial variables, particularly jump height is where it's gonna be most present, and then obviously secondarily in the ground contact time, jump height is easy to see because typically that will be far less of a decline down to here compared to the sharpness of decline of the anaerobic profile. Much the same, the ground contact time will only have a slight increase compared to the anaerobic profile over here where that's a bit steeper. So this, this subject here would much more so fall under the category of aerobic. This is how the jump profile should be interpreted for the 60 jump test. Identifying the various thirds of each graph will assist you in interpreting the uh, type of athlete profile or the performance profile. So just to recap, if the lines intersect on the far left, that is going to be anaerobic. If the lines intersect in the middle third, that person is considered combined or a mixed athlete or a hybrid athlete is sometimes used to describe these individuals. But if the performance variables have see minimum decline in jump height or a minimal decline in, or rather increase in ground contact time, that individual will be considered an aerobic profile.